Hello, my name is Fraser Simons. This is my channel Springboard Thought. Today I'm going to be talking about Ghost Written by David Mitchell. This is part of my series where I'm reading all of his books. This is the second to last one, step seven for me. The last one being Utopia Avenue, which came out last year. So I'm going from his first book to his very last book. And uh, that just seems par for the course. I basically chose a book to start at random, even though I, I read Cloud Atlas twice already. Um, I just started at a Thousand Autumns and then just sort of springboarded to the natural um, book being referenced within it, choosing emergently to go from book to book, basically. So I came at this at a bit of a weird way. Most people would probably start with this book from what I can tell. People usually recommend to read them chronologically, but I did not. And I still found it a very interesting, rewarding experience so far anyway. As you can see, I tabbed it quite a bit, different colors being different books and passages that I liked. And so you can see um, this book ties in a lot with other books actually, some of which is spoilery. So I will talk about this book as much as I can, give you a little review on it. And then I'll go into spoiler territory, talking about how it ties into all the other books, as far as I can tell. I'm sure there's plenty of stuff that I missed in all of these videos, but I am more interested in trying to make all the associations that I can while reading these than to sort of like look up on Wikipedia or, or whatever, how all of the stuff ties together. Ghost Written is usually compared to Cloud Atlas and called like a proto Cloud Atlas basically. And I think there's good reason for that. This story has 10 chapters, uh, two of which is the same character. Every other chapter is a different character and different things happening. And it jumps around the globe when it does this as well. So it's a globe trotting thing, not in a travelogue way, although some chapters can feel a little bit like that. It's more about getting a breadth of experience from a diversity of cast within this new world that David Mitchell has created. And the set of Cloud Atlas's novellas, which are broken up across the novel and returned to, these stories are self-contained and they really do feel like short stories. They're small glimpses with like a central tension that as soon as it's resolved, it's over. And sometimes it's not even resolved, it's just cut to. And then the next chapter in the book will be another short story that will reference the previous one, even if it's not um, overt in how it's doing that. And sometimes it will be a chapter in which it sort of ties a bow on the previous one, and other times it's just things that are happening and it references what happened before. The main difference between Cloud Atlas and this is just that Cloud Atlas is much more refined. It has a very unified theme that it ties throughout it, whereas this somewhat lacks from that, but it's still quite interesting. It would take me a very long time to recount every single character and all the things that have happened. And a lot of the time I actually can't do that because even the introduction and the um, name of the character and what is happening is sort of a spoiler for what has preceded it. So instead I'll talk about it in broad terms. Each chapter is a different place. So it goes Okinawa, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Holy Mountain, which is in China, uh, Mongolia, Petersburg, London, Clear Island, which is in Ireland, and Night Train and Underground. Night Train, I think, Oh yeah, it does say where it is. It's in um, South America, I believe. And then underground is a surprise. We get young and old characters. We get uh, very different stakes, very, very different stakes in each one. Some chapters tie into the meta component of the David Mitchell books, which if you don't know, I won't spoil here. It'll be in a later section, but it's exciting to have a explicit uh, meta chapter and it's fun that it took me so long to get to another meta chapter after Bone Clock Slate House 
um, because it sort of like built up a bunch of anticipation for me and so when I got it it was just very satisfying. There's a chapter about like ostensibly an AI intelligence, there's chapters about a, an old lady who uh, runs a tea house overseeing uh, all the changes in the land as she grows old. Uh, there's young love, there's old love, there's a womanizer uh, who's basically into non -con well, it's not non-consensual, it's consensual polyamory, but, but the character behaves in such a way that you would expect most men who say they're polyamorous would behave, basically. Um, there's themes of vice, indulging in our inner demons, confronting our inner demons, and it's just a, a very wide sweeping scope of a story and so it is very poignant and sometimes very profound but there is a couple chapters just like with all short stories uh, collections at least that I have consumed they vary in how interested you are in them and the not quality but just the overall enjoyment of each one varies so still ended up being a four-star read despite some of the chapters being definitely five-star reads. We can see David Mitchell's voice uh, not quite as refined in later books. It is a little bit jarring when he moves from story to story. Uh, the voice still has his chameleon-like quality but it just takes a little bit while to get into the character voice and to lay the groundwork to care about the character whereas in latter books it's just so immediate that and it's not even noticeable so i could see both why it's so polarizing by fans it's just like some people think it's second to only cloud atlas some people don't like it at all because it is literally him at his first level work of craft and his latter novels are just superior in a craft-wise way. For me, this built up from a three-star read to a five-star read to a four-star read. So you can kind of tell that it's like a little bit of a, a curve for me where I loved, loved, loved certain aspects of it, especially as it's building up to a kind of, not really climax because they're all short stories, but to the stories that I connected with the most are in the middle, for sure. And uh, the ones that I connected least which are at the back end of it, I would say. There's no real um, catharsis that I felt with the story when it was over, but it's interesting because if I hadn't come at the books in the way that I had, I might have been one of those people who considered this book lesser than four stars and maybe just a three star okay David Mitchell debut. Um, wonder where he's going but hasn't quite got there. Just because of that huge amount of anticipation that comes with going from book to book looking for the favorite characters or their sons and daughters or old people or whatever, how they're situated in the overall timeline of this universe is fascinating to me. And also it's just quite interesting to get that meta level component, like I was saying. All these questions that I had about bone clocks, ironically, if I had started here, I would have known already. So it's just very interesting that I began with bone clocks and Slate House and A Thousand Autumns and got some of these meta things and then wondered about all of these aspects and if it was intentional white space that is being left. Um, and some of it is, but a lot of it is answered, at least in a very specific character's instance of the meta component, it is answered. So that's my cryptic response. <laughs> this ended up, as I said, being four star read. I liked it quite a bit. If it's if you're into David Mitchell, I think it's essential canon. There's a couple books that you could miss out on. A couple Easter eggs and then you'd move on and it wouldn't be a big deal. Things like Black Swan Green and Number Nine Dream, I think, would be books that you could skip and you would kind of 
not miss them on the overall grand scheme of the timeline, but they're still very enjoyable books that I also rated four stars. So it just depends on what you're looking for. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit of spoilers. I'll go through them as I remember them, um, like specific book to book. So if you miss one, maybe I'll have the foresight to timestamp it so that you can just skip to the specific book that you have read to see about how it ties in. I'll try to remember that. <laughs> So in the book, there is a um, tie-in with Louisa Ray, who is a, a journalist at Spyglass Magazine in Cloud Atlas. And Spyglass Magazine is littered without, but not specifically in this book, or in Number Nine Dream, which I found interesting. Only the latter books, it seems to be like a sort of set piece thing, uh, an anchoring point for David Mitchell to use. And Louisa Ray just calls into the radio station, and she is presumably already a journalist that is famous. So it's interesting because these don't have timeline stamps on them like other books where it specifically says what the year is. So you kind of just have to guess. And so this is probably like around Cloud Atlas time for her, but it definitely jumps around temporally in this book. So you never quite know. Uh, you can tell for certain things. For instance, in a different chapter, uh, Tim Cavendish is in it as a publisher who is not all old and kind of ruined like in Cloud Atlas. Um, and he's like sort of at the height of his powers and there's like a, um, crap, what's his name? Debert or something like that. His brother is in it as well, who runs a very successful law firm and he is embroiled in like a um, little bit of a scheme in the book, basically. So it's interesting that those characters appear, but they're also, again, on the peripheral. So the next book is a spoiler for Black Swan Green, which is completely incidental. It is uh, just one of the reoccurring characters from Black Swan Green is now older. One of the kids, I believe, Neil Burrows? Brose? There's a kid that um, the main character in Black Swan Green sort of looks up to and is like, um, puts an end to some of the bullying and stuff like that. And his last name, it's like Finch or Niles or something like that. That last name also appears in this book. And I was like, hmm, these, so it must be like these kids have grown up now and they now work in this place. And that's just another Easter egg thing. They were completely incidental, I think, mentioned one time, maybe twice or something like that. So it's just interesting to see where they ended up. In Number Nine Dream, there's a character named Sabatar, I believe is their name. And this is a character who's like a, appears in the Mongolian chapter in Number Nine Dream. And if you recall in that video, I was saying how that um, seemed like it was a chapter that was narrated possibly by an atemporal being um, and that seems to be a confirmation of it in this book as far as I can tell. At, at the very least the character is reoccurring and he's like a um, black suit spy KGB ostensibly um, character who reoccurs so that's neat. What? He's, he's got a fairly big part in this one, actually. Out of all of the tie-in characters, he's less peripheral than in uh, this one, which was neat. I liked his character quite a bit. For the Bone Clocks, there's two tie-ins as far as I can see. Dwight Silverhand appears in it, but again, is very peripheral. I think he's just mentioned as just being published. And he is mentioned in the Bone Clocks, and I think also in Slade House peripherally as he is publishing a book that is about like um, mysticism and religion and, and things like that. It's meant to be sort of like a goalpost for a temporal metafiction type stuff, as far as I can see. And then also Mo uh, Monteverdi, who is in Ireland, is a character. And I just 
can't really place how I know the character, but I know the name for sure. I think it's at the end of the Bone Clocks where um, the main character, Holly, ends up knowing some people from Ireland there and she's in like a sort of semi-relationship with one of them and it might be that person. Otherwise, it's just a person who shows up in the Bone Clocks as being in her community and is somehow interactive with that. But again, it's a very peripheral thing. So there's a lot of little ones peppered all about. The only thing that I was a little bit disappointed I didn't get from this book was uh, Louisa Ray's dad is a very big time, big shot at Spyglass magazine. I think it sort of is alluded to that he put them on the map initially based on the other books that I've read. And I was very surprised so far that we haven't had a chapter from that perspective before. But especially because it's mentioned a couple times, the her Holly's husband in the Bone Clocks um, works for Spyglass magazine. And so I think he mentions how um, not Louisa Ray, but her dad is an inspiration for him to become a wartime photographer. And then also, um, also in Cloud Atlas, when it, it, she's asked if she is the daughter of her, that guy's name that I can't remember. And uh, it makes it out to be like a big deal. So maybe eventually we'll get a chapter from that. And that sounds like it would be very interesting. He seems to have like blown the lid wide open on some stuff. So it would fit in David Mitchell's overall sort of um, like altruism versus nihilism type theme with the atemporal stuff. So as to spoilers specifically for this book, so I could talk about all the aspects of it that I did like that are spoilers. Uh, first of all, let's start with the atemporal stuff. If you keep hearing me say atemporal and you don't know what it is, uh, go to my videos on the bone clocks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, essentially in the bone clocks, it is alluded to that there is a meta narrative happening. So if you don't want this spoiled, then um, you won't be able to watch this section because I cannot talk about Ghost Written without talking about that. Basically, an atemporal being suggests that there are souls out there that um, come to be untethered from their bodies, but not dead. And they act in certain ways. Some of them uh, just sort of like stick around and then they inhabit other people's minds. Some people are aware of this inhabitation, others are not. And they can be manipulated or not. They're sort of like a passenger, but they can kind of like, what it's called is suasioning people uh, to do certain things at specific times. And the more that they do this, the more the host is aware of them being sort of like controlled essentially. Or they can just sort of ride along and uh, survive in this way. But in this book, an atemporal being who is not specifically named, but I think might, might be Dr. Marinus, it, or, or at least it suggests is another horologist. And the horologists are a group of atemporal beings who have gathered together to battle carnivores. And carnivores are bad atemporal people who stick around by uh, staying in their bodies that they're born with and leading victims in a very like intricate, complex, weird sort of ritual in which they're willingly led to this thing where they're converted into a blood wine and when drunk, the carnivores are able to um, preserve their bodies, stay in a stasis live for a very long amount of time and they're called carnivores because they eat humans basically and the horologists don't like that they're killing people and try to kill them and fight them or, or whatever as much as they can the carnivores sometimes form packs just like the horologists and we see one of those packs in the bone clocks we don't see it in this book this book i think is the the story of Marinus or somebody. It comes about in the chapter of the Holy Mountain in which a old woman at the end, very young girl at the beginning, tells her story about living at the Holy Mountain in China where 
Uh, she sees three regime changes, I think, across her life, and she comes to form a very um, familial bond with a tree that she thinks talks to her, but it's actually a spirit who's inhabiting her and pretending to be the tree. And the spirit doesn't know where it has come from and has lost all of its memories in order to do that. So it's sort of like aimless and inhabiting people at different times and, and trying to like reverse engineer what's happening. But they've lived for um, ostensibly a long time already since possessing the old lady. And in her chapter, we actually see her um, talk about a very specific story that the atemporal being within her recognizes. And so when somebody leaves, the uh, old woman is made to uh, touch the traveler, enabling the person, the atemporal being, to inhabit the other person that's leaving. And so their journey kind of goes. And so their chapter uh, springboards off of that and has them going across Mongolia and meeting other people and stuff. And, and it finally uh, culminates into them inhabiting a host who has like previous memories in it and it turns out to be a young girl who um, at the time of the atemporal beings killing or untethering of the soul was um, sort of gifted the memories of uh, that being so the end of the chapter is just when they get all their memories which is a little bit frustrating alternatively it could be a couple of the others though which is annoying i have a feeling that the bone clocks make it makes it like specifically say who it is because there's a chapter in the bone clocks where the a temporals are talking about it and they go back into their past reliving how they met each other and they talk about a little bit of the lives that they inhabited previously and i bet one of them must talk about the grandmother or, you know, the young woman who's got the memories now and all that kind of stuff. So I'll have to, I don't know, Google that or just wait until I feel like rereading the bone clocks at some point to see. But it's really interesting because it um, defines how an atemporal being is sort of like created, basically. And also, um, or at least is made to realize that they're atemporal, essentially. Not all of this is like codified, it's leaps of inferences and stuff like that, but it's interesting that we know that they need touch because in the bone clocks, some of them need touch, some of them don't. They can sort of like astral project. Each of them has like different gifts that they specifically have. So it's, um, and, they develop them across centuries, so he would be like, or they would be a, a very young person during this story in Ghost Written, and they don't really have like that much of their powers. They can suasion, and they can inhabit people when they touch, and that's about it, I think, is what's shown. Anyway, aside from that, what I also really liked was there's a innocuous sort of like uh, young romance thing that is tossed in there that ends uh, right at like a decision and then in the next chapter as a peripheral we see those people and we kind of learn about what happens to them like the bow tie of their story relationship or whatever is occurring in somebody else's story as a peripheral thing as like somebody people watches them which I thought was just fascinating and, and really interesting there's a chapter specifically on like an AI presence that is able to inhabit different satellites and is like watching over humans and wondering, it's kind of like getting its mor morals from a talk show host who is the person that Louisa Ray um, talks to in the middle of the night when she can't sleep. Uh, but it's, it's very, that chapter felt more muddled because I wasn't sure what I was supposed to take away from it, really. It ends before uh, something very explicit happens. And so I was kind of wondering if that was meant to tie up some central themes or kind of bookend things in a way that it didn't actually 
um, get across to me and then maybe it would have been a five star read. I'm not sure if I just missed something completely. And then it ends at the beginning with the indoctrinated cult person who commits a terrorist act and decides basically uh, not to at the end do something else. So it feels like it's trying to communicate some larger themes in a more sloppier way, I guess, than Cloud Atlas was. Or maybe I just uh, wasn't paying attention too much to a through line because I was having too much fun with these like short stories and not seeing um, more than the self-referential stuff from the previous chapters and not like overall themes. Like there's a, a chapter in which a pretty shitty person basically uh, cheats on his wife and they he ends up widowing her and joining the ghost of a young woman in an apartment building that he uh, was inhabiting and then that ghost girl ends up being uh, somebody who ties into the Holy Mountain Chinese character and so there's some interesting things happening there, but I don't see a very specific this is what it all means type of thing that I would have liked to have seen. And that's why I gave it four stars instead of three. Anyway, if you read this book and you do see the narrative three, through line or the um, themes that I'm missing or what have you, or just have thoughts on the book, put them in the comments and we'll have a discussion. Can't wait to uh, go to Utopia Avenue, see if there's more connections happening, see if Louisa Ray is uh, there, because I think it takes place in the past before her. Although Louisa Ray's story in Cloud Atlas is like 1973, so probably not, because I think this is the 70s as well. But maybe she'll be there, that'll be fun. And um, I will catch you next video. See you later.